There, there, there. Who's hurting you, you silly girl? What you take me for? I'm oh, my Bible elf. I never spoke shut a up, word. Shut up, shut up. Do I look like a policeman? He made everything appear effortless. Well, he's got a magic, and that magic never went away. We have a problem. He was a wonderful, very edgy actor. It's a little like a, a thoroughbred racehorse. Going to run, he's going to win. But he's dancing around and kicking the stall before him. He was very rebellious. He would never conform to, to what people expected him to do. Well, I suppose being a woman, you can't help it. I can't help what? Making a fool of yourself. Every moment of his life was a performance, and every performance was a work of art. But while he gave the world dozens of indelible screen characters, Rex Harrison's private life was often a tumultuous drama, one that rivaled any of the tales he brought to the stage and screen. Reginald Carey Harrison was born on March 5, 1908, in Heighton, England, a small rural town just eight miles from the bustling seaport of Liverpool. He was the third and youngest child of William Harrison, a handsome, flirtatious man who provided a good living but preferred socializing to hard work. His mother, Edith, was a strong-willed, no-nonsense woman and a stabilizing force in the family. As Reginald was the only boy, he enjoyed constant attention and pampering from his mother and two older sisters, Sylvia and Marjorie. He was, as his own admission, a mama's boy, and he did love women. Uh, he, of course, he was brought up in a predominantly female atmosphere. In 1914, Great Britain was thrust into Europe's war to end all wars, and Reginald's life changed dramatically. The family moved to the industrial town of Sheffield, where his father took a job in an armory to help serve the war effort. But life in Sheffield was difficult for Reginald. The fields and trees of his hometown of Heighton had been replaced by gray streets and factories, leaving little to distract the six-year-old from the bombing raids that often shook the working-class city. He was not a completely healthy child, given to uh, illnesses, and sadly, he developed measles, which took away most of the sight of his left eye. To take Reginald's mind off his troubles, William and Edith took him to the theater where a whole new world opened up for the frail boy. When they brought him home, he stood in the, in the living room and bowed over and over again. That's the part he liked. And that was, he decided to be an actor. I guess he liked the applause. Always a precocious child, by the age of 10, Reginald abandoned his given name in favor of something more befitting an aspiring actor. He decided that Rex, with its Latin connotations of being the king, of being the monarch of all he surveyed, was a much more appropriate stage name than Reginald. And of course, you got it in bigger letters on the billing. After World War I ended on November 11, 1918, the Harrisons left Sheffield and relocated to Sefton Park, just outside Liverpool. Rex was enrolled at Liverpool College, where he immediately joined the school's Junior Dramatic Society. In 1922, when the 14-year-old won his first role in a school production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, he realized there was more to acting than applause and became determined to master his craft. In 1925, upon completing his formal education, Rex was accepted at the Liverpool Repertory Company as an actor in residence. Under the tutelage of theater director William Armstrong, the 17-year-old student did odd jobs and watched rehearsals before taking to the stage in his first professional production, 30 Minutes in a Street. Though he had little money in his pocket, the handsome young actor was gaining a reputation for being quite a ladies' man, and by the age of 19, his fast-paced lifestyle and exploits with women earned him the nickname Sexy Rexy. Rex was what you could call a young man about town from an early age. In fact, he liked the company of rather fast women, so there was a sense of, of raciness in his character, of the good life, the good times, 
an expensive time so long as someone else was paying for it. In 1927, after just two seasons with the company, Rex was ready to tackle London. Though hardly a stage veteran, the determined actor got his big break in a 12-week tour of Charlie's Aunt, where he received excellent reviews for his comedic performance. Setting his sights on London's prestigious West End, the ambitious actor landed small roles in Richard III and Getting George Married. But when his third West End production, The Ninth Man, was lambasted by critics, Rex was back on the road with the Cardiff Repertory Company. For the next six years, he lived the life of an itinerant stage actor, touring with various companies all over England and appearing in a different town every week. Rex modeled his own manner very much on the kind of character he had to play in what you would call the society comedies of the time, where Rex would be the young rake, the uh, young gentleman about town, the young aristocrat. But in 1933, while at a party in London, Rex met a young honey blonde model who took his breath away. Her name was Noelle Marjorie Colette Thomas, but everyone knew her as Colette. Colette was a beautiful English country girl uh, and vivacious and enchanted Rex. And it was quite obvious that he was smitten with her and she with him, and it was an obvious partnership. She was a very well-connected girl. And I think that was part of the attraction because Rex had a streak of snobbishness in him. Uh, he liked to feel well-connected. After a whirlwind romance, and in spite of their parents' objections, the two were married in January of 1934. Colette's uh, father didn't like the idea at all. He saw through this rather impoverished young actor who came down and seduced his daughter. But Rex was well matched by Colette because in his women, he liked that sense of sporty combativeness. The newlyweds took a small flat in London where Rex was determined once again to break into the city's famed West End theaters. Years of touring had seasoned the confident 26-year-old into a fine comedic actor, and he quickly won small parts in various London productions. His good looks and growing reputation also earned him cameo roles in a series of low-budget films, including The Great Game, School for Scandal, and Leave it to Blanche. But pay for the stage and film work was meager, and trouble with finances often caused heated arguments between Colette and Rex. Though the couple celebrated the arrival of a son, Noel, on January 29, 1935, their marriage was stormy at best. They used to fight a lot. I think that their relationship was um, a wonderful love affair that degenerated into a bad marriage, which happens. But despite the turmoil at home, by 1936, things were looking up professionally for the hardworking actor. At the age of 28, Rex won a leading role in Terence Radigan's French Without Tears, and the play became the most successful comedy in West End history. British film producers, eager to capitalize on Rex's exploding popularity, cast the stage sensation in the witty social comedy Storm in a Teacup, opposite a promising newcomer named Vivian Lee. What sort of man are you, anyhow? Well, did you ever know a decent sort of chap who could tell you straight off what sort of decent chap he was? I never knew a man do the mischief you've done for no reason at all. Well, look here. If you really want to know, I'll tell you something I never told. No, I won't. Goodbye. Impressed by his polished performance in Storm in a Teacup, director King Vidor offered Rex a supporting role in the taut social drama The Citadel, co-starring Rosalind Russell and Robert Donat. After 10 long years of struggle, Rex Harrison had become one of Britain's most popular actors. Now cocky and confident, he was ready to take Hollywood by storm. But unfortunately, another storm was coming one which would threaten both his career and his country. On September 3, 1939, Great Britain was thrust into World War II, and for the second time in his life, Rex Harrison found his country under attack. With a noble sense of patriotism, 
Rex turned down MGM Studios' film contract, choosing instead to stay in England and serve his country. Rex tried to enlist and was turned down because of his poor eyesight. So for some time, he continued his theater and his film career, except that the war disrupted both. By the end of 1939, when German bombing raids had closed or destroyed theaters all over London, Rex joined other West End actors and began touring the provinces. At the age of 31, Harrison was performing in the same theaters where his career had begun, but this time, he was a star. With his wife, Colette, working for the Red Cross and his son safely tucked away with his in-laws, Rex was living the life of a single man once again. He soon met an attractive 25-year-old German actress named Lily Palmer, with whom he had much in common. She was a remarkably gifted person in many spheres. She was a wonderful actress. She was a very accomplished novelist. Uh, she was a remarkable painter. In 1940, after a troubled five-year marriage, Rex separated from Colette and set up house with Lily. Envisioning a life shared both personally and professionally in the manner of such legendary thespian couples as Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontan and Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee. Once settled in their Chelsea home, Rex began work on the film adaptation of George Bernard Shaw's successful play, Major Barbara, opposite the illustrious British actress, Wendy Hiller. During the film's production, the actor had the opportunity to meet the legendary playwright when Shaw visited the set on his 84th birthday. When Major Barbara was being filmed, Rex had a big drum in front of him, which he had to bang. Shaw said, I would like to show you how I think the drum should be banged. And Rex took direction from Mr. Shaw, maybe better than from anyone else. <laughs> Although Shaw considered Rex the premier interpreter of his work, the movie opened to mixed critical reaction and suffered from unfavorable comparisons to Shaw's Pygmalion, starring Leslie Howard and Wendy Hiller, which had been released a year earlier. During this same time, the accomplished actor toured England performing in numerous plays. He also appeared in a series of films designed to boost public morale, including the enormously popular spy thriller, Night Train to Munich, starring Margaret Lockwood. Lovely lady in distress meets a gentleman of many identities on a non-stop thrill trip. And what thrills it gives you. Are you just going to sit there and do nothing? Now, please, don't mix. Don't you realize what this means? Yes, I do. But he has a gun and I haven't, and he's got a couple of reserves next door. Would you take the four bulldog, Drummond? England's entertainment industry had reached its lowest point during World War II but Rex managed to continue working in both film and theater. He hadn't given up on his desire to serve in the military. In 1942, after appealing to the Royal Air Force Board, Rex was accepted into the RAF Voluntary Reserve. Guiding the planes back, issuing instantaneous commands, making split-second decisions, making sure he was continually obeyed, obeyed, obeyed. This reinforced Rex's own arrogant character. Brimming with confidence and pride, the 35-year-old actor decided to make things more permanent with Lily. And on January 25, 1943, the two were wed. For the next two years, Rex and Lily enjoyed their new life together amidst the air raids, blackouts, and food rationing of the continuing war. And on February 19, 1944, the couple celebrated the birth of a son, Carrie Alfred. Ironically, my mother says he was happier during those years uh, when he was going off to serve on bitterly cold nights uh, in the RAF uh, than at any other time in his life. That same year, his tour of duty completed, Rex was honorably discharged from military service and returned to making films for the war-weary nation. Rex and Lily made their first film together, The Rake's Progress, and audiences and critics alike applauded Rex's seductively rakish performance, as well as the obvious screen chemistry between husband and wife. 
Rex and Lily were offered contracts. Rex by 20th Century Fox and Lily by Warner Brothers. If they would go over to Hollywood and make movies there. Leaving their infant son behind with Lily's parents, the couple boarded the Queen Mary and made their way to America in 1945, along with a ship full of returning GIs. The refined British actor had accepted a seven-year contract with 20th Century Fox, and his meager officer's pay was replaced with a royal salary of $4,500 a week. The Hollywood newcomers rented a suite at the luxurious Beverly Hills Hotel, and Rex reported to the Fox lot for the lead role in Anna and the King of Siam, co-starring Irene Dunn. To familiarize U.S. audiences with British stars, executives like Daryl Zanuck, production chief of 20th Century Fox, are signing up such actors as Rex Harrison, slated for Anna and the King of Siam. The film was based on Margaret Landon's book, about the real-life relationship between the 19th century Siamese king, Mongut, and an English governess, Anna Leon Owens. Fearful of embarrassing himself in the challenging role, Rex hired an acting coach, and together they developed the mannerisms and high-pitched accent that brought the self-important potentate to life. Why shall you contradict me? I'm only trying to help you. Is it help to say I am wrong? How can king be wrong and woman be right? I ask you that how? I'm afraid, Your Majesty, that it has happened sometimes. It is clear you are not scientific. Why are you here? Because you told me you intended opening my school today. My astrologers are fools. How can this be good day for schools? You may go. Rex was always difficult to work with because Rex had a very clear idea of how the character should be played. He was not a man who took direction easily. On the other hand, Rex's instinct was frequently right. Anna and the King of Siam was a huge hit and firmly established Rex Harrison as a bona fide movie star. A major event in the world of motion pictures, the premiere of Anna and the King of Siam. On the left, Rex Harrison with Mrs. Harrison. He's the star along with Irene Dunn in Anna and the King of Siam. Riding high on success, Rex found an unusual and intriguing script about the romantic notion that love transcends death. The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, in which he starred opposite Gene Tierney, cast Rex as the spirit of an arrogant sea captain who falls in love with a woman he can never touch. How dare you say that? Because it's true, you were fond of him perhaps, but you didn't love him. I suppose you're jealous because no one put on mourning for you. That shows how little you know about it. Some poor misguided female, no doubt. Three poor misguided females, to be exact. While Rex got along famously with his talented co-star, once again, he clashed with the director over artistic concepts, cementing his reputation as a troublesome actor to work with. The Ghost and Mrs. Muir was a box office hit, but the headstrong actor was receiving more attention for his off-screen behavior than his on-screen accomplishments. What he didn't reckon on was that Hollywood was a very hard-working place. It was a place where you had to go to bed early and get up even earlier and do a good day's work and uh, be very careful of the way you behaved in public, lest Hedda Hopper or Luella Parsons should spot your uh, sins and report them in her column. But Rex Harrison was not one to alter his behavior for the sake of convention. He began a very public affair with 28-year-old actress Carol Landis, who offered Rex the kind of danger and excitement that was missing in his five-year marriage to Lily. Landis herself was no stranger to bad publicity. She had already married four times and was notorious for her numerous affairs and suicide attempts. While gossip swirled around the flamboyant couple, Rex's growing popularity remained undiminished, and in 1948, he joined forces with famed comedy director Preston Sturgis to star in the wicked comedy Unfaithfully Yours, opposite Linda Darnell. But throughout the film's production, reports of the Harrison Landis affair were making headlines, and Rex soon grew tired of both the publicity 
and Carol. Carol Landers had imagined that Rex would divorce Lily Palmer and marry her. But Rex was a selfish man, and Rex certainly was not going to invite the disturbance to his home, to his marriage, perhaps to his financial arrangements, by divorcing Lily. Harrison called the relationship quits, but for Landis, the affair had become a more serious matter. Overcome by grief, on July 4th, 1948, the fragile actress took her own life rather than lose the man she loved. She took an overdose. The result really was both a tragedy and a scandal that did Rex no good at all in Hollywood. Heartbroken and guilt-stricken by his lover's death, Rex found himself under attack by an angry press who were quick to point the finger at the 40-year-old actor. To make matters worse, the ill-timed Unfaithfully Yours was finally released. In it, Rex devilishly and brilliantly played the lead role of a symphony conductor who suspects his wife of infidelity and imagines different courses of action he could take. What's the matter with you? You're not laughing quite so hard now. What are you going to do with that? Have you ever heard of Russian roulette? Why, certainly. I used to play it all the time with my father. I doubt that you played Russian roulette all the time with your father. Oh, I most certainly did. You play it with two packs of cards and... That is Russian the... bank. Russian roulette's a very different amusement, which I could only wish your father had played continuously before he had you. <laughs> but after the Carol Landis scandal, audiences assumed Rex's dastardly on-screen persona mirrored his off-screen antics, and the film suffered as a result. People have drawn all kinds of, 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 of obnoxious conclusions about it, but it was, it was an incredible tragedy. I mean, I, I don't know how he went on with his life after that. Although the affair had put a chill in their marriage, Lily remained at her husband's side. Due to the scandal, Fox dropped his contract, and after only three years in Hollywood, Rex Harrison had suddenly gone from charming rogue to social pariah. His career and reputation in ruins, Rex Harrison escaped to the safety of the stage. But his darkest hour would soon become his moment of triumph. In the summer of 1948, Rex Harrison and his family left Hollywood and retreated to New York City. It had been more than a decade since the actor tread the boards of Broadway, and he was eager to return to his first love. Rex really found it very convenient to leave Hollywood and go off to New York to appear in Maxwell Anderson's Anne of the Thousand Days, where, amusingly enough, he played Henry VIII, the man who had six wives. Yes? Five minutes, please. Thank you. Though off to a rough start during out-of-town tryouts, once in New York, Anne of the Thousand Days ran for a spectacular 288 performances. Yes, Henry? Do I come too soon? Will it, will it tire you to speak? No, Henry. I'm glad to see you. I just want to look at you two. My queen and my, my prince. Harrison's peers lauded his performance and critics sung his praises. But for Rex, the true sign that he had redeemed himself as an actor was when he was awarded Broadway's most prestigious honor, the Tony for Best Leading Actor of 1949. Broadway work continued, and in 1950, Rex and Lily appeared together in Bell, Book, and Candle, and even returned to Hollywood the following year to star in The Four Poster, a light-spirited bedroom farce about manners and morals. What's that? It's a bed. I can see that. Built for a lifetime, guaranteed. We can pass it on to our children. Our who? After seven years of marriage, Rex and Lily were finally on the cusp of joining the ranks of Lunt and Fontan. But ironically, Rex chafed at the idea of a mate with a career on par with his own. Working together had only magnified the differences between the two actors. Once again, Rex was feeling restless. In 1954, while making the British film The Constant Husband, a romantic comedy about a man with six wives, 46-year-old Rex 
fell madly in love with his 26-year-old co-star, the luminous and irrepressible Kay Kendall. No one could possibly blame anyone for falling in love with Katie. There's a line of, of William Blake's that says, exuberance is beauty, and that was Katie. After 11 years of marriage, Rex and Lily separated, although they continued to work together while he carried on a tempestuous affair with Kay. But in 1955, Rex received an offer to star in a Broadway musical, one that would forever change his life and his career. Based on George Bernard Shaw's play, Pygmalion, My Fair Lady told the story of a British elocutionist who transforms a cockney flower girl into a lady. Rex got the offer of his life that really established him as one of those stars people never forget. Playing Professor Higgins with his tweed hat on and his English aristocratic airs and that wonderful tongue that could tongue lash people as well as caress them was very much to Rex's liking. He loved Shaw's plays, so he loved the idea of playing Higgins. One of the things that he's responsible for in My Fair Lady is keeping so much of the original text in because he fought for it. And I believe that's one of the things that made it uh, as great as it is. With music by Alan J. Lerner and Frederick Lowe and co-starring the lovely and talented Julie Andrews, My Fair Lady opened at the Mark Hellinger Theater on March 15, 1956 and was a smashing success. Rex Harrison as Professor Higgins, Julie Andrews as Eliza Doolittle, and cheered to the rafters. After running for a year and a half to standing room only audiences, Rex took home his second Tony Award, and at the age of 48, he became the reigning king of Broadway. There's no escaping the fact that for him it was the, the one in a million, where everything comes together for an actor. He was a, a, both a matinee idol and a light comedian, and also an actor of some gravity and subtlety. And it was so perfect for him. After the success of My Fair Lady, Kay and Rex moved into a charming seafront cottage on the Long Island shore, where they reveled in the company of old money socialites and indulged in a reckless, playful lifestyle. But after only six months of unwedded bliss, the actor's life was turned upside down when he received shocking news. One day, Kay's doctor sent for Rex and said, your good friend Kay Kendall is suffering from leukemia. I've not told her that. When Rex confronted his wife, Lily, with the details of Kay's illness, he received a startling response. Lily said to Rex, the only thing to do is this. You and I get a divorce. You marry Kay, live with her as long as Kay lives, and after that, I'll remarry you. On June 23, 1957, at the age of 49, Rex Harrison wed for the third time, knowing even as the vows were being read that the marriage would never last. Rex devoted every possible moment to his new bride and even worked with her in The Reluctant Debutante, a charming comedy starring Sandra Dee and John Saxon. Rex Harrison, the inimitable star of My Fair Lady, Kay Kendall, the fabulous comedian of Les Girls. Jimmy? Jimmy, are you all right? Yes. No! For two years, Rex and Kay were inseparable. But on September 6th, 1959, Kay Kendall passed away at the age of 32. Nothing in his life had prepared Rex for the devastation he felt after Kay's death, and he sought solace in the arms of his ex-wife, Lily Palmer. My mother you know, was, was appalled by what she experienced as having her husband stolen from her by Kay Kendall, and I don't think that, um, I mean, she may have forgiven him, but there was no possibility of closeness. Tormented by his emotions, and now suffering the loss of both women, the 50-year-old actor was once again the focus of unwanted media attention. And he was beginning to question whether his professional accomplishments would ever outshine his turbulent personal life. In 
In 1960, Rex Harrison was without a woman by his side for the first time in his life. Returning to his native England, he put aside his dapper image and accepted a standard actor's salary at the Royal Court Theatre to star in Chekhov's Platonov. The play was a great success, and Rex won the Evening Standard Award for Best Actor, as well as the heart of his leading lady, a 33-year-old Welsh actress named Rachel Roberts, whom he married on March 21, 1962. That same year, Rex was approached by 20th Century Fox for a leading role in their big screen extravaganza, Cleopatra, and he signed on to play Julius Caesar. But when Rex flew to Rome to join the production, the eyes of the world were already trained on the scandalous extramarital affair between his co-stars, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. To make matters worse, the film was seriously over budget and over schedule. But Rex Harrison managed to turn in an impressive and powerful performance. The smoke of burning Roman dead is just as black, and the stink no less. It was pumping, and I wanted it so. Cleopatra turned out to be the most expensive film ever made. And although it took in a then staggering $24 million at the box office, it was still considered a financial failure. Nevertheless, Rex Harrison would be nominated for an Academy Award as the year's best actor. And although the award went to Sidney Poitier, Rex was enjoying his hard-earned reputation as one of Hollywood's most respected and bankable stars. He was also negotiating to reprise his trademark role as Professor Henry Higgins in Warner Brothers' lavish film adaptation of My Fair Lady. It was on the terrace of his house in Portofino that Rex got the very good news about the film version of My Fair Lady. And Rex threw his arms out like that and said, by George, I've got it. She's so deliciously low, so horribly dirty. Oh, I ain't dirty. I washed my face and hands before I come, I did. I'll take it. Uh -huh. I'll make a duchess of this draggle-tail gutter snipe. Ow! We'll start today. Although fans of the Broadway hit were disappointed when the part of Eliza Doolittle was not offered to Broadway's Julie Andrews, the on-screen chemistry between Harrison and co-star Audrey Hepburn offered plenty in the way of compensation. He is so good that it doesn't matter whether he plays it on stage or screen, it's Rex Harrison who colors that film, who gives it its, its note of temperamental despotism that is so brilliant, particularly when it's set to music and words by Lerner and Lowe. Why can't a woman be more like a man? Men are so decent, such regular chaps, ready to help you through any mishaps, ready to buck you up whenever you are glum. Why can't a woman be a chum? After premiering in October of 1964, My Fair Lady was cheered by audiences and critics alike. And for the second time in two years, Rex Harrison was nominated by the Motion Picture Academy for his definitive performance. exciting evening for me, and I feel in a way that I should split it in half. <laughs> Winning the Oscar for My Fair Lady was a big triumph for him, and it goes back to the Carol Landis period, because, you know, the, the uh, gossip ladies um, sort of blackballed him and, and uh, told him he would never work in the town again. But on the heels of his great professional success, Rex's personal life was once again in crisis. Since arriving in Hollywood, Rachel Roberts had given up a promising acting career to be Mrs. Rex Harrison. But while her husband was preoccupied with his work, the frustrated actress turned to alcohol for comfort and support. She was a secret drinker and gradually became a public drinker and then into an alcoholic. She was a manic depressive. Oh, she was on a very bad way, Rachel Roberts.
Seeking refuge from his troublesome home life, Rex plunged into his next film, The Agony and the Ecstasy, co-starring Charlton Heston. The story told of the conflict between Michelangelo and the Pope who commissioned him to paint the Sistine Chapel. It also featured Rex in one of his strongest screen performances. I will not obey you! Will not! Did I hear you correctly? Will not! Yes! I'll destroy it first, with my own hands! The best thing in the agony and the ecstasy is the confrontations between the Pope and Michelangelo, and the odd confrontational chemistry between us was crucial to the film. I don't think Olivier could have been better. But when the film's box office returns paled in comparison to the staggering revenues of Fox's The Sound of Music, Rex was quickly cast in a family-friendly musical entitled Dr. Doolittle. Playing a veterinarian who could literally talk to animals, Rex had to contend with a menagerie of co-stars. Rex Harrison talks about Dr. Doolittle. First film in which a human being, myself, actually talks to animals. I think it'll be a film which all the family, including the animals, are going to want to see. Including you, Chi-Chi, aren't you? Chi-Chi? <laughs> yes! <laughs> But although Dr. Doolittle went on to win two Academy Awards in 1967, the $17 million production proved to be a dismal financial failure. But much worse for Rex was the fact that his wife Rachel's condition had worsened. In hopes that the work and companionship would alleviate Rachel's deepening depression, Rex agreed to co-star with his wife in A Flea in Her Ear, Feeling quite well. Where are you going, my little tomato? God knows. Let's go have a drink. See the can can girls wiggling their bottoms. Have a little squeeze under the table. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. But in 1969, Rex was pessimistic about his wife's deteriorating mental state and finally realized that he could no longer help her. Inevitably, their rocky seven-year marriage came crashing to an end. Rex Harrison had lived life to the limit, and his constant womanizing and love of life's finer things had left him alone and kept him from his one true love, the stage. But as the aging star faced the final act of his life, he still searched for applause and one final bow. By 1970, the emotional strain of his divorce from Rachel had taken its toll, and Rex Harrison turned to family friend Elizabeth Harris for solace. After his divorce from Rachel Roberts, Rex again was the lonely man, very much dependent upon the comfort of women, but he found that the temperament of Elizabeth Harris was very sympathetic to him, a highly educated, intelligent woman who liked fun in life. The friendship quickly developed into a romance, and in 1971, the actor went to the altar for the fifth time with a 35-year-old divorcee. But Rex soon discovered that life with a woman whose world revolved around her three small children was not a life for which he was well-suited. Rex was demanding and hadn't been used to being in a family situation. His was very much a couple scene as opposed to a family scene. Good, he really tried, but I didn't feel that he tried enough. In 1974, Rex busied himself with a new pursuit and penned a witty, revealing autobiography, which was well received by fans and critics alike. But this distraction did little to help his ailing marriage. And once again, Harrison found himself in the dubious position of leaving another woman he loved. Over the next two years, Rex performed in six plays, including a one-man show the performer created based on George Bernard Shaw's theater critiques. And in 1977, while attending a New Year's Eve party in Monte Carlo, Rex met a sophisticated beauty named Mercia Tinker. The following year, Rex asked her to become his bride 
and was inspired to publish a book of love poems entitled, If Love Be Love. Now 70, Rex's age and failing eyesight was threatening his ability to work, but nothing could keep the irascible actor off the stage. He would told Mercer, if the doctors say there's anything serious with me, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to know about it. I'm doing a play. Rex worked nonstop over the next five years, appearing in such productions as The Kingfisher, co-starring Claudette Colbert, the 25th anniversary revival of My Fair Lady, and Shaw's Heartbreak House. The tireless thespian had become one of the most respected actors in the world. But his greatest honor was achieved at the age of 82 when he was invited to kneel before the queen for a knighthood. You couldn't possibly get a knighthood if you'd been married more than once uh, or lived abroad. So there was a major breaking of the rules, um, and I'm sure he appreciated that, even though it, it did come extremely late. For Rex, who had proudly lived the life of an English gentleman, it was a moving experience and the honor of a lifetime. Do you enjoy it as much as you did 50 years ago? Yes, I love it. It's my life, really. On November 20th, 1989, Sir Rex Harrison opened on Broadway in The Circle, co-starring Stuart Granger and Glynis Johns. He could hardly see, and he had obviously paced out the stage, and he, was, he gave this performance, and you wouldn't know there was anything wrong. And the sheer terror it must have been getting up on stage when you, could, you couldn't see. But only six months into the play's run, Rex's declining health forced him to leave the production. When doctors diagnosed the actor with pancreatic cancer, the family agreed to keep the news from him until the very end. On June 2nd, 1990, Sir Rex Harrison died at the age of 82 with his sixth wife by his side. And at the actor's request, his ashes were spread along the Mediterranean coast. I've grown accustomed to her face. For more than 60 years, Rex Harrison ruled the stage and screen, appearing in over 100 films and plays, and in the process, earning two Tonys, an Oscar, and a knighthood. Rex was, in fact, a kind of a thorny guy. Uh, there you are. But he was so good, it was worth with the trouble it took. In many ways, he did live for those moments when he could show himself uh, through a part. And he always seems to me to be even more vividly alive in those moments uh, than I knew him to be off stage. If there's a legacy that he left me in terms of being a man, it was to not uh, stand on ceremony and to, to not be unnecessarily reverent and to not take things too seriously. He never stopped. He never was satisfied. He always would strive for more and more and more. I've grown accustomed to the trace of something in the air, accustomed to her face. 